Good morning, church. It's so great that you can join with us in today's Bible reading from home. I will be reading today from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Please join with me from verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of our Lord. Well, thank you, Cece, for that Bible reading. Uh, my name is Felix, one of the pastors here today, and we'll be continuing our Rediscovering Prayer series today. But I want to start with this question. Why pray? Why pray? I mean, a few weeks back, we got the theological reason for why we should be praying to our sovereign God who is in control. Uh, we pray because God chooses to use our prayers to work out His will. But on a practical level, though, why should we pray? I mean, most of us, uh, we have what we need and most of what we want in life, we just need to work hard to go out and get it, right? Um, our parents tell us that if we want that job that we want, then we just need to study harder. If we want a nicer car, a nicer house, we just work harder and save up. You want to learn a new skill? Well, there's probably an online course out there that you can do from the comfort of your, of your own home now. So why should we even bother asking God? Why should we bother praying when we can do it all ourselves? And so as we continue our series on prayer, we'll be seeing why we just really need to be asking God for all that we need, even if we don't think that we need to. But let's just quickly recap uh, what, where we've been so far in the series. Uh, in the first two sermons of our series, we saw the privilege of prayer, the privilege of prayer, that we get to pray. We get to pray to our good and powerful God because we've been adopted as his children. Uh, this is something that we're going to keep coming back to over and over again, this privilege. Uh, but also God chooses to use our prayers to bring about his sovereign will. And two weeks ago, we started looking at the content of our prayers. What are we to pray for? And we saw that the, the prayer that should be at the top of our priority list should be praying for God's glory. But see, the question then is, what about our needs? When we started looking at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 a couple of weeks ago, we only considered the first two lines, praying for God's glory. But the very next part of the prayer considers how Jesus tells us to pray for our personal requests. So how about we read uh, that prayer again from the beginning? Matthew 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so here we see three big things that we are told to ask for when it comes to personal prayer. Verse 11, we're to ask for our daily bread. Verse 12, we're to ask for God's forgiveness. Verse 13, we are to ask God to help steer us away from temptation, from doing what God knows is wrong, was bad for us, and not to fall into the devil's schemes. See, a big part of personal request is our spiritual needs, isn't it? Asking for forgiveness and asking for God's help to fight sin. But the first request, the, the request that Jesus starts off with, is actually one thinking about our personal, our physical needs. And the thing is, though, this first request, doesn't it seem a bit odd for us to pray today? Daily bread? Why would I even need to ask for something that I almost automatically have in front of me every single morning? Uh, it's not even that we have what we need in terms of our food. Uh, we've got bread or food for days to come, right? Our pantries are full of preserved tin food that will last for months, rice that will last for months. Our fridges and freezers are all stocked up just in case. We're set. So why ask for our daily bread? 
Well, the first thing that we need to realize is that asking for bread here isn't just asking for literal bread or literal food, because bread here uh, is a catch-all term, meaning livelihood. It's the bare necessities of life that we need to survive, right? So that can include health, it can include a roof over our heads, our family, peace, and so on. And see, for much of human history, right before we had industry, before we had government welfare, the typical experience uh, of someone was uncertainty day by day. If the land or the seasons didn't play nicely, uh, that would threaten the amount of food that you might have uh, in the future. But now, it looks like these problems have largely been dealt with, right, through technology and progress. And on a personal level, our livelihoods seem pretty secure, right? Uh, I mean, we have secure, well-paying jobs. We have parents who provide for us. And we even have a government to make sure that we can get by, even if it comes down to that. But here's the thing. Even with all the sophisticated food preservation technology, even with all the fancy economic and financial structures that we have put in place to keep ourselves from having to worry about our livelihood on a daily basis, we haven't actually lost our dependence on God. Not one bit. See, we need to know that we are still utterly dependent on God. We are still utterly dependent on God. I mean, we just need to dig a bit deeper, right? Just ask ourselves, who gives us the means to work? Who gives us our health, our upbringing, the family that we were brought into, the affluent country that we were brought into? Was it all because of our hard work? Who has given us a stable job to work in? Who has allowed it so that our stable job can continue amidst the fragile ecosystem of our economy? Who allows the physical, natural environment that we are living in to be sustained to bring about the stability, right? There's nothing that we can do to produce that stability. stability. There are forces way beyond our control here, right? And ultimately, of course, of course, it's God. It's God who has given us all of these things that has led to our ability to work and to earn a living. And I don't need to remind ourselves of what a year 2020 has been so far. We've seen, at the very beginning, homes and lives devastated by the immense bushfires raging across Australia. Then we have COVID-19 that we're still struggling through right now, putting so many jobless, turning our lives upside down. And we've been blessed by a government that's handled it well so far, right? But look at just how much difference uh, a bunch of leaders in other countries who've made different decisions have made to the overall impact of this pandemic. And so I'll go so far as to say that what's going on around us should serve as a good wake-up call for us, a warning sign for us that we ought not to be putting our trust in our man-made structures of uh, security that we think we're safe behind, but to instead, we need to depend on God more. And so that's the first thing we need to recognise that no matter how full our fridges, our pantries are, no matter how, uh, how much our stock, stock portfolio is in, is in the black, our bank accounts or superannuation, no matter how full they are, we need to realise that we are still utterly dependent on God for all that we need. That's the first step, to realise our dependence. And once we do that, once we know that we are dependent on God, we need to pray. Once we realize that our livelihoods are literally hanging by a thread in God's hands, then we need to be asking God to be sustaining us day by day. And at this point, you might have noticed that Jesus here is teaching us to pray for our daily bread, daily bread, not daily Wagyu steak, not a lifetime supply of all the groceries we would ever need, right? First and foremost, this is a prayer asking for our basic needs to be net, met uh, rather than pursuing all the luxuries of life. And so the obvious question then is, are we allowed to ask for things beyond our basic needs? Can we pray for things like comfort and peace, for stuff like financial security and job security? 
What about job satisfaction? What about having good weather on the upcoming holiday that, we're, that we've got planned? Well, let's take a look at our next passage. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, Paul tells the Philippian church that we can bring all our prayers and requests to God. And so, yes, we can ask for things like comfort. We can ask for things as long as, uh, as well as the things that we absolutely need to survive. But I think this passage also tells us that we need to come with the right expectations, the right expectations and the right attitude when it comes to bringing our requests to God. See, we need to ask God with the right heart. We need to ask God with the right heart. Here are a few, a few ways that we can do this. Uh, the first is this. We ask trusting that God knows best. We trust that God knows best, even if we don't think that's what we need right now. Because notice what it doesn't say here, right? What, notice what it doesn't say? It doesn't say that as we present all our requests to God, that God will give everything that we ask for. But what is the result of us asking God in everything? Verse 6. Paul starts by saying we shouldn't be anxious, right? We shouldn't be anxious, but we should instead pray. And in verse 7, the anxiety that we might have had before is now replaced with the peace of God guarding our hearts and minds in Christ. See, through prayer, anxiety is replaced with peace. Anxiety is replaced with peace. That's why we should pray. Because praying makes us exercise our dependence on God to trust in the one who is in control, the one that we know loves us and is all powerful. See, right? we bring to God what we're worried about so that we can leave it up to God to do what is best. And that should give us peace, right? See, we don't have to wonder if what happens next is actually the best outcome or not. We don't have to wonder the what if. What if I don't get that job? What if I don't win at that auction for my dream house that I really want? Because if we prayed about it, if we've given it over to God, then we are saying, it's in God's hands. And we are learning to let God decide what is best. What is best for us? What is best for God's will? And, that's, and so the one way that we can be doing this is as we bring our request to God, we will be asking for God's will to be done. We will be praying for God's will to be done. Now, the clearest example of this is Jesus' own prayer before he was betrayed and crucified. Uh, so let me start a bit before, um, it, it, before the prayer in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 36 to 39. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Yes. We can bring our requests to God. We can come to God truly, honestly, in who we really are. But we also need to recognize that ultimately, our highest priority is to want God's will to be done, not ours. And you know what else this prayer tells us? Is that as we come honestly, utterly honest with God, even when our emotions are pulling us away from what we know to be God's plan, we can still come. See, Jesus, as he prays this prayer, he already knew what he came to do. Earlier in the gospel, he had already predicted three times, three times, he predicted that he would be handed over to the human authorities to suffer and to die. He knew that. But Jesus doesn't hide his anguish and his sorrow for what is to come. 
Now, Peter, next week, will be going deeper on this topic of how we should be praying through our suffering. But for now, let's just notice that despite Jesus' strong emotions for what lies ahead for him, he still asks God for his will to be done, for God's will to be done, rather than demand God to give him an easy, comfortable remainder for his ministry on earth. And this is how we should be asking God as well. See, as we ask for the good things in life, for healing, for success at uni or school or work, for relationships, we need to come humbly recognizing that God has a perfect will, a perfect plan. As we grow in our trust of how good God is, as we appreciate more and more the wisdom, the infinite wisdom of God, then we can trust in God's will, even if it's not what we want right now. But what does that look like? Because it's more than simply adding your will be done to all our usual prayers, isn't it? Because if we're to follow Christ's example, then the heart of asking for God's will to be done is to honestly be laying down our requests along with all our emotions, to be wrestling with God almost, to be wrestling with this possibility that what we want might not line up with what God wants and to wrestle with that fact and be okay with that. It is to say, Lord, I really, really want to get into this uni course. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm not sure what else I want to do if I don't get in. But Lord, I trust that you know what's best for me. So if you don't want me to do this, please help me to keep trusting you. But I, I, I really, really want this, Lord. But if it's become an idol for me, then please help me not to love this degree more than I love you. Or maybe, maybe you've been struggling with an illness for a long time now and you pray, Father, could you please bring healing? I feel so weak and so frustrated right now. If you don't heal me, I, I don't know how, how much longer I can keep going. But hey, please, help me keep faithful to you. Give me your strength so that no matter what happens, I can keep glorifying your name, right? If there's something that you really want, our intimate relationship with God means that you can feel free to ask him for it. He is our loving heavenly father. Feel free to be open with God because he delights for his children to come and be honest with him. But we need to remember that God knows best. We need to come asking first and foremost for God's will to be done. Now at this point, I've talked a lot about trusting in God's will a lot. But the thing is, why should we be trusting God's will? Why, why not just do what we think is best? Well, we can trust in God's will for us because we know that God loves us. We know that God loves us. And when I say this, right, I don't mean that God's love is some abstract, distinct thing out there, airy, fairy, some sort of way. It's not some conceptual thing like a lot of these new age thinking people have, have been saying, oh, God is love, the universe is love, but nobody actually knows what that means. No, the, the love that God has shown us in the Bible, through scripture, through history is tangible. It's real. If you go back 2,000 years, you could touch, you could feel literally with your hands how much God loves you by feeling the pierced hands of his own son, Jesus, sent to die for us on the cross. See, that, that's why we pray for our needs before God. Because we're not praying to some impersonal force of the universe. We're asking our personal redeemer who has sacrificed his own son for us who has suffered on the cross for us. That's why we can trust God's will for us. And by sending Jesus to die for us, this actually reveals to us our deepest dependence on God. We need to be asking for our deepest need. We need to be asking for our deepest need because our dependence on God isn't just for our daily food, not just for our basic necessities to keep on surviving on this planet, but more importantly, our spiritual life as well. 
Because what Christ has provided for as he died on the cross is provide for a way for us to have eternal life. Perfect life, no more suffering, no more pain, perfect relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so yes, Christ has already died for our sins, but it doesn't mean that we've stopped sinning yet. And so we need to keep coming to God to confess our sins, to lean on God's mercy for forgiveness through the completed work of Christ. And we pray not just for, for, for forgiveness of sins, but we also pray that we might not sin in the first place, that we might be able to resist temptation so that we might not fall into sin. We pray against the one who is so desperately trying to entice us, seduce us to just have a taste, just to doubt for a moment that God, he might not truly have our best interests in mind, to just have a taste, turn away from God, do what we know is wrong. Because what's at stake here is our connection, our relationship, our intimacy with the good God who loves us and who sustains us. That's so important, right? And so that, that's why Jesus only tells us to pray for our daily bread, but then spends three times as long, four times as long, teaching us to pray for our spiritual needs. The question for us then is, do we see God's forgiveness, God's protection from temptation as our deepest need? Do we truly value and treasure our spiritual well-being, our intimacy with the Heavenly Father like this? Because our prayers can actually reveal what we truly value, isn't it? What we spend the most time asking God for could very well be the thing that's most important in our lives. And so, yes, I know there are certain times where, where you will be praying intensely for something that's, that's right there in the moment, that's really important. That's appropriate when that happens. But I want us to think about our prayers in the long term. Over the course of the last few months, say, how much time do you spend praying for forgiveness, praying for the strength to fight temptation, to hold on to the intimacy with God? And if we come to realize that we're not prioritizing our relationship with God, then guess what? That would be a great thing to be asking God for. Confess. Confess to God that you've prioritized other things, other people over Him. And ask God, ask God to be working within you through the Holy Spirit to set your heart back towards God. Ask God to help you fight temptation, the temptation of desiring other things to replace God in the top spot in your life. And to keep asking God to sustain you, sustain you spiritually, to protect you from Satan's schemes to turn you away from God. Let's ask God to sustain us in our deepest need. So to close, why, why are we to ask God for our personal needs and desires? Well, asking God, it teaches us that we are utterly dependent on God for all of our essential needs. It helps us to trust in our good and powerful God to know what is best for us. And we know this, right? We know that God knows what's best for us because he's not spared his one and only son to die on the cross for us, to provide for our deepest need. We pray because we are utterly dependent on our loving Heavenly Father for all our needs. So how about we pray right now to our powerful and loving God? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we confess that at so many times we often don't realize uh, that we are utterly dependent on you and we are self-sufficient in a way that means we just go on doing the things that we want, achieving the goals that we have without even considering asking for you or realizing that you are the one who gives all these things to us, including our every breath. Lord, please be at work in our hearts so that we can really feel and know that you are the one giving every single thing that we have to us. And we are totally dependent on you for all that we need going forward as well. And help us to keep coming to you in prayer, in dependence, humbly acknowledging your will as we do that. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.